The goal of the pond sizing tool is to help people decide how big a pond they need by answering the question about the benefits that they can expect from various storage volumes. This question would be easy to answer if we had a nice benefit cost ratio function where the there was a certain best size of the pond. Now we certainly don't have costs and that's very unlikely to be available in a tool like this. So the best we can hope for is some kind of a function of benefits as a function of size of pond. So if there's some kind of inflection like this, there still might be a best, but usually we're probably going to have, um, well, that's what we don't know. We don't know what this shape is like. So. What we did was select two metrics that will start to provide insight into the irrigation potential and the water quality benefits for a range of pond sizes. So that's what I'll explain how, what we did. So there's two major benefits. The first is the crop yield benefits from irrigation, and the second general category is the water quality benefits from recycling water. This tool is not sophisticated to predict exactly these. So what could we predict? Well, we can get at the amount of irrigation water. That's not quite it because you don't want the total amount of irrigation water, but it's in comparison to what's needed. So what we came up with for a metric is the amount that's needed versus the amount we actually had available in the pond, uh, and that we call the storage deficit volume, and that will be plotted in red. For the water quality benefits, what we'd like is the pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus that didn't go into downstream water. Closer to that would be the water captured. What we actually use is what we call the bypass flow volume, which is the volume of water not captured. For any one year, this is what it looks like. The pond level, the pond water depth, is plotted in gold, and it's on this axis, so I gave 10 feet as the initial depth, and all the water gets used up here. The bypass is plotted cumulatively, so it starts happening in January and up through April. There's a far, fair amount of water we couldn't capture and then there isn't any more. The deficit, also plotted cumulatively, only starts occurring in July and ends up later in the summer. The algorithm for triggering this still needs some work. Each year is different, so I just picked out a dry year here, 1988, where the pond started out at zero and it only went up to you know its full size for a very short time and then down you don't see the blue line it's here at the bottom there was no bypass flow but there was lots of irrigation deficit in a wet year the opposite the pond is up here full most of the time um, plenty of bypass flow the blue and no irrigation needed so there was no deficit or maybe there was irrigation but there was always plenty of water just knowing how it behaves in a few wet and dry years is not what people really want. You want um, many years average to make some kind of a prediction. So um, then we take those graphs that I just showed and average them over all the years. And they had the pond volume of 50 acre feet. Now you see more what we expect. The, the pond volume goes up in the spring and down in the summer. There's some bypass and there's some irrigation. Um, so this is much smoother. This happens to be an average over 30 years. This starts to let us look at the difference between 50 and then 10 over here. Um, they look pretty similar, but the axes are not the same. This has 100 as the maximum. This has 80 as the maximum. So both bypass and deficit volume, the blue and the red, are higher when we have a pond volume of only 10 acre feet. That's a very small pond. I don't think anyone would build them that small. Um, so we also put in 100 acre feet, and here again they look similar, but now the axis is only 60. So now we can compare, you know, the total bypass is maybe 50 here, whereas it was maybe 65, 70 here, and the same for the irrigation deficit. So that gets at what we originally um, developed the tool to do, and so therefore we've plotted these as the, the primary output to show the benefits across pond volumes looks at these totals for any pond volume. So 10 is what we looked at first, and the average total bypass flow when we had a pond volume of 10 is maybe 90, 
And if we build a much larger pond of 100 acre feet, then the total flow that didn't go through the pond is down to 50. And the, the irrigation that we would have liked to have but didn't, the storage deficit is maybe at 60 with a very small pond and at uh, you know 20 with a large pond. So that's the output that we thought people would like to have to um, actually make estimates across pond size. Now to use this tool, obviously many inputs are required and there's two main ways that these inputs can be supplied. The most desirable would be that a user has some kind of a time series for precipitation that's easy, drain flow that's really hard, uh, and ET. So any of us at our sites where we've been monitoring drain flow can actually supply the time series for however many years we, we have data. But to help people kind of use this tool without it, we have modeled drain flow, or we have all this data modeled by Laura Bowling and her student Charlotte Lee. This is one output. Um, there's a lot of detail in these models, and I'm not going to discuss that here. That would, I'm sure Laura can discuss it at a future time. But anyway, that's what goes into it. The results are obviously different if you are in Indiana, which is what I have been showing, and we get a bypass up here and a um, deficit down here, or if we compare to a place in Iowa that I picked out where we have a deficit volume above the, the bypass volume. So I don't think any of these numbers are right, but at least the pattern seems correct and it seems like what people might want to know. And if we take those same locations and look at our primary output, you get um, in Indiana, the both are going down with higher pond volumes, but bypass is higher than storage deficit. And in Iowa, we have the opposite, but both are going down by pond volume. So those are the outputs of the tool. Here's the program itself at drainage.agriculture.purdue.edu. The things to fill in starts with the drainage flow into the pond. Here's the drained area because we're uploading a depth. The first option is to upload a CSV file and it should look like this. This shows the column in the CSV file. Before you upload it, you need to delete these two rows at the top that show the headings. The other option is to select a location, and that uses the modeled input. So you can you get the map, and you select a location, and then click Submit, and the model has, will run with that. I think the rest are self-explanatory. Some of the harder ones to understand have tool tips here to understand what you should do with them. Once you're satisfied with the inputs, click Submit, and then we get the results that were discussed. The first result is the overall for any pond volume, bypass volume, and storage deficit volume. Then you can select one of the pond volumes, for example, 50, and look at the results averaged over all the years. This is averaged over 30 years for the um, pond volume equals 50, probably should say acre feet. And then you can drill down even further and pick one of the years, for example, 1985, and look at that. So those are the results we have so far. We plan to add more outputs and more visualization, but that gives an idea what to expect.